Welcome guys, today I have something really, really special. Today I have Susan and if you know anything about Enneagram and if you're really deep into it, you would probably know who she is. But if you don't know, that's fine. Today we are going to do something really interesting. I know nothing about Enneagram. She knows a whole lot, like 20 years worth a lot. And she has professionally worked in so many different settings. I thought, you know what, why not learn the Enneagram? And uh, in that way, you guys get the opportunity to learn as well. And if you have any questions or anything, if you don't understand, you can always comment below. And in the next video, you can address that as well. So it's like an ongoing process because Enneagram is all the new thing right now. But I feel the understanding is not applied in a helpful and loving way. So we are here to shine some light upon that. But before all that, Susan, like, how did you come up with Enneagram? How did you like, end up with this? How did you end up here? Hi, well, Prem, thanks for having me. And I'm hey. so excited to be here with you and share what cool. I've come to love about this incredible system. So I actually came into this completely by accident. I was um, uh, a communications designer working for an organization development firm. And that firm brought in Dr. David Daniels to teach CEOs how to work with their executive teams and their companies. And they use the Enneagram actually with the CEOs. Whoa. And David would teach this with uh, another man named Frank Lee, who owns an organization development firm who I was working for. And I'd never heard of it. Um, I was handed uh, David's PowerPoint to get prepared for this um, offsite meeting with, I think it was 15 CEOs. And I just thought, what is this? And I was going through a really, really bad divorce at the time. My daughter was four and I had no idea what had just happened to me. I was a, a shambles and the Enneagram really started to speak to me quite immediately, particularly because of David Daniels and the way he taught the Enneagram uh, with so much compassion. And he's standing there in front of all these CEOs and so many people who know me know this story, but he says, you know, learning this is going to change the amount of compassion you have from other human beings. And he almost had tears in his eyes talking to these fortune 500 guys and supposedly in organization development, you're not supposed to get touchy feely. You know, you're not supposed to go <laughs> with anybody. He, he was just so passionate and heartfelt and loving. And what happened over across those five days with him teaching the Enneagram really changed my life. And I'm took copious notes and I heard aspects of myself and I it started to make sense for me as far as the healing that I needed to undergo to get through the divorce and also understand myself and my and my childhood it impacted some of the, the things I needed to deal with etc so that's how I got into it and David invited me to do his week-long uh, Enneagram intensive which by the way is still happening um, Helen and David developed a phenomenal school which is now called the narrative Enneagram and that same program that I took 20 years ago is available today. And it's um, wow. highly recommended. So I ended up certifying, went all the way through the program, took me three or four years. Um, and I ended up certifying as a teacher, not because I had any intention of teaching. I just wanted to complete this for myself. And mm -hmm. I pretty quickly started um, coaching and um, working with other Enneagram leaders and working with David and his organization to bring the conference um, to more people because I have a marketing background. And then I started working with Susan Olesic um, when she just got certified as a teacher and um, started any Enneagram prison project with her and her husband who came in later on. And then that catapulted me into a whole nother level of working with the Enneagram and seeing the potential of the Enneagram for self healing which is where I think the Enneagram has the most incredible power and usage is for our own self-development, for our own self-healing that the Enneagram puts into our own hands, my own assessment of me, because that's when we're really going to grow. I mean, it, I, you know, I, I mm -hmm. work with lots of different therapists in my career as a, as a designer and a marketer and, and, and they're doing great work out there too. But if we don't put the understanding into the hands of the person, my ability to diagnose somebody is going to do nothing for somebody. So this is why I love the Enneagram so much. 
Yeah. Uh, you mentioned something about like a prison project or something. Yeah. Any prison project and everybody check yeah. that out online. Susan Olesic is the founder and incredible Enneagram teacher. And I spent several years as a founding board member of Enneagram Prison Project and going in and out of jails and prisons, bringing the Enneagram to the incarcerated. And I worked with maximum to low security women and men, San Quentin and main jail, San Jose and Elmwood facility in San Mateo County. And I saw the Enneagram changing lives firsthand. I saw the impact of giving people an understanding of themselves, of learning about their defense mechanisms, of learning about how their Enneagram type forms a solution to early trauma, how that defense system is trackable and observable, and to really start, um, God willing, helping them make better choices for mm -hmm. their lives. We're working with, with 22 and 23 year olds on three strikes one more felony and they'd be locked up for life and so um teaching the enneagram with that kind of an imperative to really um tune into the students in such a way that my gosh if i if i just reach this person it might change their life and i saw the enneagram changing lives in the prison and so did the prison the pr they were like what are these girls doing in there because the atmosphere in the barracks was changing so much so we started volunteering and, and worked very, very hard to even get a program in prison. It was a volunteer um, program. Susan started at Elmwood completely on a volunteer basis. On a hope and a prayer, they decided to try this Enneagram thing. And, <laughs> and, and, and they were very hesitant. You know, the symbol's a little challenging for um, um, those kinds of facilities. But um, within about six to eight months, the results was really starting to show. And, um, and then we ended up landing a, a county contract that changed everything, you know, started um, allowing us to build the program and develop it. But it was started out completely volunteer, but the change and the impact compared to other programs in prison was really significant. It, it's a, so, <laughs> So the knowledge that I have about prisoners and stuff like that, and the image that comes to me because of movies and stuff, is like they're like this delinquents, you know, like beating people up, stuff like that. So, yeah. so, how, like, how are they like receptive? Are, are they even receptive to like someone coming? Hey guys, I have enneagram. You know, it's gonna like change your life. Or because I, I would assume that they would probably go, you know, who is this person? I don't care. That's you know. a great question, Prem. And before I actually went in to do this prison work, I I was like, I am never going in there. That's a totally unreceptive human being. They're scary. Um, yeah. After um, we got more than one class and I started teaching with Susan and then Susan and I were both teaching like seven classes a week to different populations. Um, oh, what wow. I found were people starving for truth. I found people who had just had never had anybody hear or care about their story of what had happened to them and why. I found the Enneagram um, was soothing. Um, I found the Enneagram was um, in incredibly received. The students were unbelievable. Um, I would say 75% um, of the prison population and the jails um, and the prisons that we were working in we're receptive. Um, I think there is a population that is um, still too traumatized, still too um, defended, still too unaware, unself-aware that it's not as suitable for those students. But mm -hmm. I would have thought before I ever went into prison that maybe 10% were receptive and 90% were not. And actually the opposite is true. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, honestly, I, I have to believe you because you actually have experience, but it's hard to believe because the, the image that comes in my head is so, uh, you know, it's like uh, basically like movie style. Uh, but, but but it's interesting that it actually worked for them. And so what kind of changes did you see like six months later, eight months later? Like, Yeah, no, great question. Um I, I want to add a caveat that we went in with the Enneagram and we're learning um, and studying trauma and addictive disorder oh. at the same time. So um, having that understanding as facilitators was really critical. Um, mm -hmm. 
and understanding the connection between addictive disorders and trauma, absolutely critical. And that was the work of Gabor Mate, that is an advisory um, board member of Enneagram Prison Project and who, whose philosophies and teachings we adopted very early on into our curriculum. Um, Interesting. One of the things that we discovered very early on with the with the the prison population, the incarcerated population, is that the sense of self is so damaged. the 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 system of self is really disordered, and they've been told they're a loser and worthless. And I mean, that's more prevalent than the one who is really confident and loves himself and knows he's going to have a great life. That you didn't find those people. <laughs> so, yeah. teaching the enneagram. By the talent and the gift and the strength of the temperament is how we started. So we laid that as the initial foundation. So getting them back in contact with some of the value that they have, that they're not awful bad people. They have done bad things. Some of them have done awful bad things, but to, to, to start building the foundation of self. And from that foundation, then they can start looking at what their defense system looks like how they've harmed people, how they've harmed themselves. But, you know, we'd spend the first four to six weeks doing nothing but building up the development of the self and allowing them to start honoring who they were and believing that they had qualities that were of value, that that weren't just accidental good parts of themselves, but that those parts were really viable and that they could lean into that goodness. Um, of course, Susan and I are both type one. So, you know, trying to get aligned with our goodness was kind of how we went about it, but it was, it was very effective too. And then once you get that foundation built up of, of I'm a seven and I'm a six, and that's why I, that's why I worry all the time. And that's why I reframe things all the time. And, you know, they started, they started understanding their own choices and behaviors and, and then it gave them a lot more fortitude and um, self-compassion, actually, to start looking at their defense system and looking at how they impacted people, mm -hmm. got in trouble, looking at why they were making those choices. Um, yeah, it was um, it was extraordinary to watch just the development of the self in an honoring way and the impact that that was having on them overall. It was changing the compassion level in the barracks. So instead of like hating on each other, they're like, oh yeah, John's a two and oh yeah, Steve's a six. And like, they, it became like this fun way to understand each other. And instead of all these like, like arguments and hostility toward one another, in a lot of cases that you find, I mean, prison is not a safe place. Um, <laughs> yeah, I assume so. Yeah. It just got safer. They started operating more with kind of a group mind. And that's what the... That's what the authorities at the jails and the prison started to notice. Like, whoa, this has actually created some kind of a camaraderie that wasn't here before, some kind of a uh, little more safety with one another that didn't exist before. And that's really what got us this, landed us this contract, or we were asked to apply for it because they saw that the program was having some very unusual results for that environment. So, so let's learn it. I'm, I'm interested. I'm curious. Let's, let's understand it. So, so how do we begin? So what's like, so what's Enneagram basically? What is the Enneagram? So the Enneagram really is a personality temperament understanding system, and it is based on nine fundamental, I'm going to use the word temperaments because the Enneagram points right back to differing temperaments, which we, we've all known, like you've heard this in the lexicon for generations you know oh his temperament or her disposition or her character like we've been pointing at it naturally that you know we're kind of wired differently and we sort of know mm -hmm. that but the enneagram is an incisive look at what makes temperament unique from one person to another person and in the enneagram ennea means nine in greek and gram or grandma means drawing so it's enneagram it's basically a nine pointed figure nine pointed yeah. drawing as where the name came from um but it points at nine particular organizing temperaments of the human collective and you know each one of these nine temperaments actually contributes to the evolutionary success of humanity so each one of us has a talent and a contributory gift that has about allowed us to evolve and survive. You take one of the nine out and us as a whole called humanity 
um, don't function as well. And mm. so while we are so afraid of our differences, actually our differences are our survival and, um, you know, breaking the, the understanding of temperament down all the way into individual relationships. When you think about um, a couple arguing and yeah. it comes down, why don't you see it like me? Yeah. I don't yeah. know what's wrong with you. You know, well, what's yeah. not what's wrong with you? It's like, what's your different perspective? Because thank God you and I do see things differently because that allows us to contribute to our survival and our, and our world in two different ways. And we both bring something different to the coupleship. But unfortunately, until you learn something like the Enneagram or tendency to point at what is not like me in you causes an awful lot of conflict. So the Enneagram really helps us understand the nine different ways of perceiving the world, mm -hmm. interpreting the world and contributing to the world. Nine different contributions, perceptions, focus of attention, mm -hmm. most important, nine different ways of descend, defending ourselves against threat. Threat to our physical body, of course, which is very similar on all of us. We all see a bear. We all either run or we hide or we freeze or, or we fight. But the threat to the self system, the threat to my image of self has to be defended. And we do this in nine different ways using the strength we have in our Enneagram type to do so. So... Uh, so you mean temperament is like an archetype is what, is, what does that word mean exactly? It's like no, an archetype, is it? Like I mean, the smart kid in the class, the fast kid in the class like that? Well, temperament is how you are, how your central nervous system is wired to receive impressions from the environment, process those impressions, interpret them a certain way, and then some kind of response or reaction. So for example, um, one temperament, when it gets angry, is going to fight. Another type, when it gets angry, shuts down and goes real quiet. That's happening at the level of the central nervous system. So when you were a tiny little boy, when you got angry, you didn't choose how you were going to respond. Your body does it for you. Your temperament and the way it's wired is what's going to unleash the response. You ever think so, about how you are different from your brother or your sister or how different yeah. you are and, and yeah yeah and why is that you know your your brother goes real quiet when he gets angry and you want to yell but, i don't know so so you're saying that like nine different responses to a given situation it's mm -hmm. almost like nine different uh characters with their own responses to the same stimulus Yes, that's right. And this yeah. is happening in the neurobiologic organization of the central nervous system, of the whole brain system, of the whole body system, of the heart, head, and gut center of intelligences in our body. We all have three centers of intelligence, the Enneagram. We begin by studying the three centers of intelligence, head center of intelligence, heart center of intelligence, gut center of intelligence. What is that? It's kind of like processing tissue processing um neurobiology in the head processing neurobiology in the heart processing neurobiology in the gut what does that mean is it's receiving impressions it's organizing mm -hmm. an interpretation and it's forming a response from the head heart and from the body for instance the heart has its own central nervous system the heart has a magnetic field around it of about 12 feet the heart has all kinds of of uh, data and impressions that it's sifting for, it's looking for, and it's reading for in the environment, particularly, am I liked? Am I connected? Am I valued? Am I wanted? Am I desired? Am I good enough? Am I um, belonging? This, you know, the heart is, is registering mm. this kind of data, right? The gut system is registering another kind of data. I'm here. I matter my territory, my room, my stance, my space, my free will, my autonomy, it's dignity, autonomy, free will, my presence. This is the gut center of intelligence. Am I being invaded? Am I being respected? Am I being violated? Am I being honored? This is the gut working on this all the time. Territory, space, um, presence, 
And then the head center of intelligence is process mm -hmm. letter kind of data. The head center of intelligence has an anticipatory, future tripping, future, future jumping, prevention orientation, anticipation, planning, reasoning, yeah. cognitive skills, understanding. So this is happening in the head center of intelligence. And these three centers of intelligence govern each single human being. So, so, uh, so yeah, so yeah, you kind of told a lot there. So from what I understand is that every person has like three different styles of, you know, almost like three different areas that process the same information you're saying. Mm -hmm. so, so if information comes, so head processes it in one way, heart processes in another way, and your gut processes in a different way. And this and is part of Enneagram too? This is, a, this is a foundational part of the Enneagram. And to add to what you just said, these three areas are sensitive to particular kinds of data. So mm -hmm. the heart's picking up the data. Do I belong? Am I connected? Am I wanted? Am I like? Yeah. You know, um, it's reading micro expressions of the face and it's listening to tones and, you know, it's it's seeing how how I'm, I'm connected or not. Do I belong or not? Do people like me or not? Right. Because we don't survive if we don't belong. Yeah. The heart knows this. The heart knows that if I'm not liked and I'm not wanted and I don't have any value in the eyes of others, I'm going to die. I'll get thrown from the tribe. I could be shamed. Yeah. Right. So the heart is working on that, those data bits. The gut center of intelligence is really working with our boundaries, our territory, my space. I matter because I exist. It kind of protects our dignity, also protects my free will and autonomy. You know, get out of my way. Let me be and go where I need to go. That's the gut center of intelligence. And so it's looking for how people are invading your, your privacy or how it's disrespecting you or people are violating who you think you are or people are taking your things or or sitting too closely to you or that's the gut center of intelligence it's spatial it's territorial and it's it's self-protecting and then the head center of intelligence is is seeing what could go wrong uh what do i need to have a great life where do i need to go where do i want to do it's shooting out to the future it's using the future and planning and preventing problems and causal thinking and anticipation yeah. it's using reason and understanding and cognition to survive so each one of these right comes down to contributing to our survival of course and as david would say contributing to having a satisfying life but one of these centers mm -hmm each person is dominant in mm. so actually even though we all have all three we pretty much in a typical western childhood will focus and and orient around one center of intelligence we tend to have kind of more gifts and aptitudes there we have a strength there we have a hypersensitivity that's kind of neurologically wired in there and that is our dominant center of intelligence so the enneagram is based on nine types and there's three types in the head, three types that have the heart center as their dominant um, center of intelligence and three types in the gut. So three, three, three equals nine. So that's so, the basis of where we start with the Enneagram is teaching nine types, three centers of intelligence. And which one are you driving from? Does that make sense? That makes sense. But where's the other three coming from? So you have like head, heart, gut, right? Mm -hmm. So, so where's like... Planted here. So actually types five, six, and seven are driving primarily from the head center of intelligence. That's like there where there's a kind of a neurological chi, like you have a lot of strengths and gifts yeah. and attitudes here. So you're going to drive from that first. Twos, threes, and fours drive from the heart center of intelligence. Mm -hmm. And eights, nines, and ones drive from the gut center of intelligence. So those are the nine Enneagram types. So what makes them different? Let's say there are three here. So what makes these three different? So, so great question. So we actually teach individually. We start with eights, nines, and ones. We start with the gut center of intelligence. I like to start teaching with the gut center from the ground okay. up. And then sure. I teach the difference between, so eight, nine, and one have similarities because they're all in the gut. They all work with the same aversive emotional system of frustration, anger, rage, kind of the first 
big system that emotes, but then eights, nines, and ones are also uniquely different. And then we go into the detail of why those three are similar and why those three are different. And then we move to the heart center of intelligence, two, three, four. There's okay. lots of similarities there because they're all three heart centered types, but then twos are unique from threes and threes are unique from fours. And so we teach how each one of them is different. And the same thing with five, six, and seven and the head center of intelligence, they all share something very much in common. They have the same first aversive emotion, a um, mammalian emotional system of fear, mm -hmm. so anxiety, fear, terror, mm -hmm. but yet fives are very different from sixes and sixes are very different from sevens. And we teach how they're individually different. So, so what Enneagram is basically tracking and the distinctions you're making is coming in the realm of how you're reacting to a certain situation, is it? Or am I, am I understanding this right? So can you say that question again? Uh, yeah, yeah. So, so the foundation of Enneagram and the distinctions you're making, it's coming from understanding how they are reacting to a situation? Yeah, so... Um... You've asked a really important question. So what makes Enneagram, studying the Enneagram really unique from other typologies like Myers-Briggs and the human potential and is it's not as focused on outward traits. And I'll explain that in a second. But the Enneagram gets to the why we're doing what we're doing. And primarily there's two things that we really look at. One is what I'm doing to be loved. And how do I protect myself under threat? How am I defending myself? The strategies of the defense system really, really tell us what Enneagram type we really are. And the strategies that I think I have to live out, express, and stay compliant to, to be loved in this world, directly point at our Enneagram type. So yeah, so these nine different Enneagram types are going to defend themselves in a very predictable way. And they're going to say the same things about who they believe they are and what makes them lovable in the world. And those two things are critical for our survival, the survival of my self-image and the survival and protection of my self-image and as mm -hmm. well as my existential survival. But we're not talking about that as much right now. I'm talking about the yeah. survival of my sense of self. So the way we defend, the way we self-protect is really indicative of your Enneagram type. And it's less about outward traits than it is about internal organizing principles. The way I'm organized on the inside is what my Enneagram is all about. And I'll give you an example. Mm -hmm. and this is also an example of the Enneagram being poorly, uh, which is unfortunately happening a lot in the, the explosion of popularity with the Enneagram. Yeah. Um, it starts out a kind of a parlor game. Oh, fives read books and nines watch yeah. TV and ones like to clean and sevens travel. And so those are externalized traits that mm -hmm. may or may not be correlated with your type. They're certainly not causal. And so um, if you go to the organizing principle of type one, I'm a type one. So everything's organized in a kind of a set of rules. There's a way things should be. And once I organize myself around a particular rule in my psyche, I have to be compliant to that. So mm -hmm. if I set a rule that my house has to be clean, and then I set a rule that clean means vacuumed, clean means bleach, clean means Lysol. And that rule is I have to do that every Saturday morning. I will follow that rule and I won't deviate from it. So it's the organizing principle of setting rules and standards and being compliant to it. That is the organization of type one. That's the structure of type one. Not the fact that the house is clean. I may or may not have set that as a rule. But it may have been an it may have been an outward trait. Mm. Not all ones, all, not all type ones have set the rule that the house has to be clean every Saturday morning with bleach and vacuuming. And, but that's an outward trait. That's one of the results of how I've organized myself from the inside out. Does that make sense? Mm. So that's a really, really important distinction. So yeah. going to type fives, 
Okay, you read books, you must be a type five. Okay, all nine Enneagram types read books. Why yeah. is it five reading books? What is it happening? What's the purpose? What's it serving? Well, type fives, in order the motivation. To, yeah, the motivation is to have something intelligent and knowledgeable to contribute. That I must be knowledgeable. I must know things. And it's it's this location of self up in the head and to understand and to to seek knowledge and and knowing things and and a very, very intelligent type five pursues philosophical questions and esoteric questions, and they're going after the big learning and the big wisdom. A, a less, I'm just gonna say a less intelligent type five. <laughs> They're just going to yeah. memorize as much as they can and not really um, embody or process it, but they're going to memorize things because they still have the same yearning, the same coordinates for being lovable as any other type fives. I've got to know something. I have mm -hmm. to bring something to the table of, with knowledge and, and I figured things out and I have something to contribute from my mind. So mm -hmm. Books happen to be available as far as me acquiring that knowledge. But in this day and age, you know, we're getting our knowledge from a lot of different places, right? We're getting our knowledge from yeah. long podcasts and workshops and conferences. And so, you know, just saying, if you read books, you must be a five. You have a five who's not leaning into books as much. Mm -hmm. They've actually got other kinds of learning oriented. You don't want to miss the fact that they're really a type five. You've got to find out how the sure. person organized yeah. inside why are they gathering knowledge like what is that why is that that's where you know the enneagram type why is the one cleaning or not cleaning why is the mm -hmm. two cake or not baking a cake so it's not about the internal trait it's about the why the why it's been organized that way inside of the person what is yeah. it serving in their self-image what's mm -hmm. it as far as their defense system so so from my understanding and this is what i understand and my understanding is i this is what i call it i don't call it a defense system at least previously what i call it is i go in this autopilot mode you know where i'm like living in this life of reaction almost you know what i mean and that reactionary life has a certain characteristics to them as i think i'm, I'm a much more thinker type i feel as people who actually watch my watch the videos know and I think when I'm doing that, I'm not consciously doing it. I'm almost like reacting to it. And it feels like what you're telling me is that the way you're typing someone is like you're tracking that autopilot feature in your head and what it's doing and how it's controlling the system when you are like off wheels almost. And your hands off what's happening, how it's reacting normally. Yeah. And based on that, you're typing. Am I understanding that right? Yeah, so the the um, in the Enneagram, we call it being on automatic because the central nervous oh. system already got embedded into it a, an innate way of responding to reality and an innate way of defending ourselves from hurt, pain, discomfort, loss, sorrow. And um, the natural way we tend to respond to that is very indicative of the, of the Enneagram type. Now, let's say we're interviewing someone in their 50s and they've been doing all this work on themselves. And while they used to be very explosive and immediately responsive and immediately expressive, you know, over the last 20 years, they've learned to pause, they've learned to more calmly evaluate the self. And so, you know, as we start working, we become more response flexible. We actually start mm. working with our central nervous system in a more expansive way and we develop capacities to respond to the world differently, more by choice rather than just by reaction, more of a response rather than just a kicked it in reactivity. So, you know, that that can sometimes skew the Enneagram type assessment because, you know, these people might tend to think they're nines or, well, no, I don't, I don't ever really react angrily anymore. And I must be yeah. a nine. That's not how this works. So mm -hmm. The way you're originally organized and designed is the way you've been designed. It is your motherboard. You know, the temperament is the motherboard. And while we can't change our motherboard across our life, and people ask me all the time, can I change my Enneagram type? Oh, you know, I used to be a six, but now I'm a, 
No, your motherboard is your beautiful neurobiological spiritual design. That doesn't change. But through consciousness, mindfulness work, self-awareness work, self-witnessing work, we become more conscious of these automatic patterns and yeah. fixations and compulsions to be a certain way. I must clean every Saturday morning, whatever my rule was. These compulsions, yeah. we, we actually can relax them without feeling that our survival is threatened without feeling that we won't be loved in this world, we can start relaxing them through consciousness as we become a more self-aware sovereign being. And yeah. that's where we actually not change our Enneagram type. We don't change our motherboard, but we certainly do change our level of developmental well-being, as mm -hmm. David said in the book, our level of development, which is what Russ Hudson calls it, the seven levels of man, which is what Gurdjieff referred to, Ginger um, Lapid Bogda calls it self levels of self mastery. So there's many teachers and and thought leaders across time who have been looking at the fact that mm -hmm. that person's defended 24 hours a day, and that first person maybe gets reacted and defended once every two weeks. And what's the difference in these two people? Mm. Developmental well being, the health of the of the motherboard and the software that it's running. Mm -hmm. the, capacity of the motherboard and the software it's running. How many viruses are you running? How yeah. much software are you running? And that's yeah. the developmental level of well-being. And that's the goal. That's the pursuit. That's the journey of a self-realizing, awakening human, which mm -hmm. at that point life gets way less like reactive and shocking and challenging and hard every single day. And it's just stress to actually being pleasant to yeah. no matter what challenge occurs or mm -hmm. trouble you have to face or conflict you have to discuss you're you're constantly in kind of a state of equilibrium and joy there's just a there's just a constancy there of me with me and i'm okay yeah. and my self is more sovereign and, it's, and it doesn't feel like you're getting tossed around in the waves in a tiny little rowboat in a storm on an ocean. You sort of feel like a great big ship, like a great big cruise ship that just moves like this, but stays stable inside. That's that's the work that. Yeah, I yeah I think yeah. So we, the the way I'm under, I'm understanding what you're saying is, it feels like the autopilot is almost not a choice. It's like a it it, it oh, I, at least for in my experience autopilot doesn't feel like a choice you know i i look at i was like walking by a and i'm like mm, i really need to price right now you know what i mean and i had this intense comp compulsion food craving to like buy this french fries and that didn't feel like a choice and i feel like what you're saying is by understanding how that mechanism arises and works you're changing the relationship that you're having with that mechanism to a much yeah. more uh a uh, loving one where where you can exercise your free will as well and it doesn't feel that uh, constricted yeah love how you said that it's we don't have a choice in the beginning and these are automatic patterns for survival and we're just leaning into the motherboard we were born with to survive and we're so hard on one another because we think yeah. that everything we do is innocent and everything everybody else does is on purpose and it's yeah. really like that, right? We're all mm -hmm. doing us with what's working inside of us and with what's happened to us and what we had to deal with. But this work is about the awareness that brings response flexibility. And what you said the word love. And, you know, it really is about a compassionate and loving view of our human condition that mm -hmm. we're, a, we're a big biochemical cocktail yeah and we don't have a lot of control over that at first yeah. you know you hear that that famous quote by v victor frankel you know between stimulus and response there's a space and within that mm -hmm. space like my choice and my freedom well that space is full of cortisol and adrenaline and nor yeah. or that space is full of dopamine that's triggering an impulse to get these french fries and so before you've even bought them you're already yeah with excitement yeah, right? yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah so in order to get into that 
space, I've got to actually have a different relationship with my own biochemistry, yeah. with my own presence of self, and to be able to pause. What's the pause? The pause is putting the brakes on the biochemicals, on the, mm -hmm. cortisol, the adrenaline, on the dopamine. It's to put a pause on the chemistry using oxygen, using presence of mind, using the holding of my own heart. And mm -hmm. Uh, the relaxation of my of my body's my gut center so it doesn't mm, and move forward and to consciously respond okay yeah i yeah. had a friend twice three hours ago and i've been mm -hmm. trying to lose a couple pounds doesn't make sense so now you're in you're, you're engaged with the self in a really mature and yeah. masterful way rather than the dopamine takes you over next thing you got the french fries in your hand and you don't know what happened yeah right or the next thing you know you've yelled at your partner and you you've said some really harsh things to them you're like oh crap i didn't yeah. want to have an argument today but it just happened happened to you yeah things happen to us until we start to do this work of getting yeah. to know who we are and how these automatic patterns are how we experience life until we do something different yeah we, true we have more choice it, otherwise we're really just kind of a puppet to these things and mm -hmm. yeah we are a slave to it and what i i work a lot with relationships and so what i see so often in relationships is i told you not to do that again i yeah. told you i hated when you do that and it's like until I do the work of self, I can't, I won't be able to not do that again because someone yelled at me and I'll fail and then I'll get stressed. And the other person thinks I'm doing it on purpose just to hurt them. And the dynamic spirals out of control really quickly. When yeah. really, you know, how much control do we really have at first? Not a lot, but it's about developing the self mastery to have more choices. Yeah. So I'm not just a pattern and compulsive type one with OCD. That's not mm -hmm. who I have to be. But you know, in my in my teens and and twenties, that's kind of who I was. And I could have lived my whole life like that. Mm -hmm. But I had another choice by so fortunately coming in contact with this system that for me resonated with so much truth that I was I was actually able to to mm -hmm. take me to becoming more than just those compulsions yeah. within my within my motherboard that's my motherboard came up with those solutions for me and that's what felt good and that's what we're going to run with your your um your personality is doing the same thing you know mm -hmm. and a single person has a motherboard that's been designed for them and that's going to operate to its best capacity for survival until we wake up <laughs> yeah that makes sense yeah that makes sense uh yeah i always wondered you know for, like for many years before i actually like figured it out where people said oh just becoming aware of the pattern that you're exhibiting like changes your relationship relationship to it you know but i but i think uh every time i'm walking around like mcd of course the french fries you know tempting then i think oh i'm, I'm aware of this pattern that i like mcd but it never actually helps me i thought i thought about it that way but then one day i realized you know it's like when you're observing when i observing my when i'm observing myself buying that french fries there's automatically a part of me a small part of me that is observing another part of me buying mm. the french fries you know what mm. i mean and that small part of me has that free will of oh you know what it's no longer a pattern but a choice you know what i mean yeah and That's i think that is like the small uh light the ray of hope in that dark room you know where there's like a small part of you that you're developing that is just noticing the pattern where that small part of you now has a choice rather than being a slave to the pattern you know that yeah. you, you said it so beautifully that's the first turn of awareness when your meta capacity your metacognition your ability to watch yourself think mm -hmm. or yourself doing things that meta capacity um is the biggest and most important shift to ever make 
And I remember Helen Palmer telling me one time, that is the first turn of self-development. And that has to happen before any of the other capacities can develop. That first turn of, oh, I can follow the impulse or I can choose not to follow the impulse. And then you're watching the impulse and you're watching, well, the story of the impulse. And then you're like, that first separation from your automatic pattern yeah. is fantastic. Very powerful. Very powerful. Mm -hmm. I only yeah, met I one, one in prison that absolutely had no capacity to get there out of all the students that I had. It is in our divine true nature that we have that, that actual self back there, that neutral observing witnessing self. It is our birthright and it's given to us and it never leaves us. We just have to get back in contact with it. Like I said, I only met one in prison that I was like, ooh, I don't think I'll ever see that happen for this young man. But everybody else, had was it was there. The self-witnessing consciousness was in there. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I feel like that is the small space that you're, I think, exploiting with the uh, Enneagram where you are now where you have already did the work, mapped out the patterns that your defense system is exhibiting and all. Now a person who is learning the Enneagram have to do is like witness it for themselves, them playing out this pattern. And when they like notice that law ultimately become a choice and then we can like walk through, you know, okay, why am I doing this? What payoff am I getting? How does it serve me and stuff like that. Okay. One thing that's so important about the Enneagram is that it actually helps you know what pattern to even look for, because before you, mm. you, do, you don't know you're, you're running on patterns. Yeah. You have no idea that there is a habitual pattern. It just feels like you. And so when you start, studying, yeah. you know, right. It's like, I'll look for things inside myself, but what do I look for? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You I know, had, a funny thing. Uh, a funny thing about you did you have a marketing background you know how in uh, emails they have links right click here or something like and that's always in blue in color you yeah. notice that yeah. and i i always like didn't notice it i was like oh it's like a good color or whatever but apparently like through research and all that stuff they found that oh if the color is blue then the person is more probable to like click that link you know right. and it's like all the marketing stuff and the color yellow and the smile and Oh yeah. You know? Oh yeah. <laughs> it's funny. My, McDonald's had all their, their chairs were <laughs> yellow, right? Because, yeah. um, and it creates adrenaline and excitement and people could sit in the chair for exactly eight minutes before they got uncomfortable because they wanted people out of there. They didn't want people to sit for very long. Right? Oh. <laughs> oh yeah. All that research is really, really, really important. But again, knowing, you know, before you start this, you don't know you're defensive. You don't know you're reactive. Yeah. You just think someone else pissed you off. Mm -hmm. You have no yep. idea that there's something inside of you that is firing off a defense or a reaction or having to protect your sense of, of the image yeah. that you have yourself. So we don't even know how to get self-realized without this beautiful map that is so educational that puts the knowledge into our own hands so that we can mm -hmm. do our own self-assessment and and you know and i always call the enneagram one of the greatest de-shaming systems ever because you sit with a whole group of sixes and everybody's sharing the same internal dialogue and the same fretting and the same view of of preventing hazards and you kind of go oh, oh these are mechanisms. This isn't just weirdo me in the world. And so that immediately changes how ashamed we are or how different we feel we are or how hopeless we think we might be. And we realize that these mechanisms are operating in all humans. We're all struggling to deal with the, the, the liabilities of our compulsions, as well as trying so hard to bring our contributory talents to the world we're all doing the same thing yeah yeah you mentioned how enneagram is the map uh, in spiritual teachings they have this quote where they say the map is not the territory you heard the map that is not the, what? the direction the, uh, no no the map is not the territory the territory 
Yeah. yeah, yeah. So I think there's like an aspect of Enneagram where you have to like actually explore the territory using the map, right? Absolutely. I mean, the 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 initial just learning of the nine types, learning of your own structure, and I like to call it a type structure. It's a temperament. It's a wiring of the central nervous system. It's a neurobiological understanding of self. You start with all of that learning. And all of that learning and all those details that this is a defense mechanism and this is what reactivity is. And you learn all these things. Yeah, yeah. All of that learning is just to give us permission to actually start doing the deeper work, the excavations of these patterns and taking them from a compulsion to an offering. So my gift of organizing structure and setting rules and standards for the way things can be, that's a gift that I bring the world. I like mm -hmm. the wall to be straight. I like my artwork to be a certain way. I like, you know, I'm bringing that structure to everything I do. And that's a contributory talent. But when I get caught in that pattern, I have to bring that structure. I straighten the painting. I have to do it. I have to. I go from a talent to a compulsion and the compulsion mm -hmm. can be operating in the negation of my own feelings and the negation of how I'm impacting others. It can actually get in my way. And this happens with all nine types. And this is where the real work begins. It's loosening the compulsive attachment to who I have to be based on how I'm organized, who I absolutely can't be. And all the compulsive tendencies that go along with that, that actually are hurting my relationships. They're actually hurting myself. And that's well now when we start getting into the exciting work of how to use the Enneagram versus, mm. you know, I'm a type one. And when I come into your house, I'm going to straighten your paintings. And that's just the way it is, you know? <laughs> so, yeah, sure. Yeah. But I, you know, the, the pride that we all have in um, rationalizing being a six or being a five or, um, there's more it's a need for approval, right? Almost. What's that? It's a need for approval, right? Almost. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. It's the way I'm going to get love and worthiness. Yeah. Out. It's funny. It's so funny about this. So I, I ordered a phone. Remember I told you I ordered like this brand new phone, but the thing is what's different is I ordered this phone, which is an online exclusive, meaning this is an exclusive sky blue color that takes like a month to ship. All right. And hopefully I get my phone anytime soon, the next week. But I got this black leather case, which is, uh, uh, this is right here, right? No, this, this case, right? I, I have this case. But the problem is this case hides the color that, I've been, that I'm like basically waiting my entire <laughs> month for. So I'm like really stuck in this dilemma, you know? <laughs> Where do I buy a transparent case so that other people know that I have an online exclusive sky blue color that, you know, you just can't go to and buy in the store? Or do I put this case on such that people don't know that I have a <laughs> have like a sky blue color for except me, you know? <laughs> You're the only one. But it's protected in case you drop it. So now what are you yeah, gonna yeah. do? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I bought a transparent case just so you know, you know. Yeah. But, and did you buy really it for you or did you buy yeah. it so others would think you're so cool? Yeah, right. I don't know. And uh, I think there's like a bit of that when someone says, oh, you know, I'm actually a type seven and uh, yeah, and you're probably a type six. You know what I mean? There's like a need for approval there almost trying to like play that game. Yeah. And, you know, you know, when you first start into the Enneagram, it, the first thing you start doing is trying to type everybody because yeah. First of all, you start seeing the caricatures and the, the 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 system of responding. You start seeing the types on people, and it's like, whoa! I mean, it's kind of exciting, and it is really yeah. fun at the beginning. And um, but that is only the beginning, and the real, yeah. the real, the real reason to study it is we stay with it long enough. It does have <laughs> a little learning curve to it, but you stay with it long enough. And you start expanding out of that very, very tight box of behaviors and defenses and habitual patterns for survival. You actually go, oh, there's, oh, I can learn to be more of this yeah. and not be so uncomfortable. Without the Enneagram, trying to expand beyond that box that we're in, it's actually really uncomfortable, all the way to scary, all the way to terrifying, all the way to shaming. And yeah. Be able to do it on our own but this gives us 
permission to go, okay, I usually don't speak when I'm angry. And as a child, when I got angry, I locked, I mean, I would lock up and not speak and be quiet. My girlfriend was so vocal and I'd go, you know, I'd like to be like that, but I couldn't, my body would never let me be like that. But as I've gotten through this journey, I can be with the discomfort of not agreeing or not wanting my angry reaction to something. I can actually be with that. And I can now actually kind of turn it into words better and faster than before when I used to wait like three months and build a case to make sure I had yeah. the right to be angry. And then I present it to somebody three months later and they're like, you were smiling, you were angry. And so imagine how awful that would yeah. be to a recipient, right? To feel that yeah. when I was your present, I, when I was present with you in your presence, you were totally not authentic. And that's something yeah. I've learned about being a type one is that we can show up very unauthentically because we can't express in the moment what's real. Everything is censored. Everything is is reorganized um, to be more appropriate or what we think we should be, be feeling or behaving. And we actually are not real in the moment. And that when that hit me, I was like, oh my God, that's just awful. Yeah, you know? that's deep. Yeah. Really know, how is anybody going to really know you when you're not real in the moment with anybody? And it's kind of scary for people to be with someone who's not real in the moment, right? Yeah. No, it's interesting you say that, and it's, I think, a really good point that you bring, which is that when I think of my defense system, I, the reason I uh, started learning about consciousness development right, was to almost like get rid of it. Because from my perspective, initially at least, when you try to do this work, it's scary, it's tough, it, you know, and all this like emotional response comes up and you don't even know how to deal with it. And my only desire back then was to like, how do how to get rid of this, you know? How to have like this thing turn off and then mm -hmm. my thing turn on. And even now, sometimes I think that way. But I think the way you are framing it with Enneagram is almost how to work together with that defense system to then accomplish whatever you want to do. Is that it? Absolutely. And I, I the way you put this is really cool is to work with it because... And you're absolutely right. When we first start into um, a relationship with someone and they start telling us what they don't like about us, I got to get rid of that part of me. I go, I can't do that. I got to get rid of it. Or yeah. we don't know something about ourselves. I was like, I got to stop that. Well, actually, instead of wanting to exile parts of self or stop, it's kind of like white knuckling the personality, which will never work because the yeah. wiring wiring the chemistry is the chemistry the needs we have to respond a certain way are there but if we honor it that let me go back to type one for a second shuts down censors the anger doesn't speak up in the moment has to justify why it feels angry what what do we know about anger anger can be very disruptive yeah anger can be very separating anger immediately splits everything into black and white me against you yeah, I, I happen to have a type nine wing. So this is kind of influence a little bit what I'm going to say. But knowing that anger separates, splits off people, can hurt people. The benefit of not speaking up is what? Protecting. Yeah, same. Yeah, you're doing same. the same thing, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Saving the relationship, saving uh, my image in someone's eyes, um, preventing them from feeling yeah. hurt from fending them from feeling something, uh, not wanting them to disconnect from the relationship. Yeah. So, so I like I, protect a part of you almost. That's right. And protecting myself. What if I um, also, I'm aware of what anger does on other people and I don't want to deal with people's anger. I don't want it coming at me. I don't want to look at it. It's ugly. Um, so I'm not going to react in the moment because I don't want a big explosive thing to happen. Once hate yeah. explodes anger, I don't like looking at it and I don't like dealing with it. So all of my mechanisms are going to prevent that from happening. So let's look at the benefit of why I shut down rather than speak up. What's my benefit? What's my wisdom around that? What's the inherent gift in that particular um, way of being for that particular response, type of response? So I honor that within myself. And then I say, but you know, when I don't speak up in the moment, first of all, I've, I've not given someone else a chance to grow. 
because they're clueless as to what just happened. I haven't given someone a chance to really know me and that feels unauthentic. So then I can start working with it. Like you said, I can start working with understanding the gift of what I'm trying to protect or govern or shy away from or whatever that is. You know, you analyze that. Yeah. And then I get the impact the, and I can start to say, what's the best choice for this moment? Do I speak mm -hmm. or do I hold back? That's self-mastery. In the choice comes self-mastery. Mm -hmm. Choice in the choice. I've had to have awareness to have a choice. But as a child, yeah. a little, there was no awareness. Lockdown, I was gone. There wasn't yeah. at all. And that that was very frustrating to me because I didn't understand um, why my friend would speak up and I, could, I couldn't say anything. Like, what? You know? I didn't yeah. I had no choice. Makes sense. So it sounds like what you're doing is recognizing a part of yourself and then building a connection with it you know yes absolutely without yeah. shame without yeah, yeah, being that part of myself without not liking it wanting to be something different than i am that's what how i'm wired like wow there's mm -hmm. some dignity in that there's dignity in all nine ways of being wired so how are you using enneagram to achieve this that's what i'm curious about so how am I using Enneagram to achieve what I just said? Well, that first comes just the education of the self. You learn all nine types, but you, you learn your, your own type. And you start out by doing your very best to be accurately typed. Um, yeah. to make sure that you land in the type that is your true neurobiology. So I'll tell you a story. Um, I um, was called upon to help someone who is very confused about their Enneagram type. They'd been um declaring as a type nine for probably 20 years in the enneagram mm -hmm. community it just didn't fit it's just it was just always bothering it just didn't fit but and so um they wanted help really trying to figure out why it didn't fit and what was going on and what type they might be and um so in the process of working with this person what i learned was as a little girl this person was very exuberant wanted to be seen and heard and felt, would come home and show her artwork to her parent, her mother. And she would show the artwork, but look what I did. And her mother would say, why do you need so much attention? You know, stop showing off. Yeah. She also would want to dance for everybody. Um, and that was shunned and humiliated. And she was shamed for, again, wanting attention. She was told to be seen and be heard. And being invisible became the only way that she was accepted by her mother. So she took, took all this beautiful, expressive energy that wanted to be seen and, 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 and received and heard. And she had to pull it all back and pull it all back and make herself invisible. This is not her natural personality. Yeah. So she's, she's distorting her natural self in order to save her attachment relationship with her mother. And all children, with very few exceptions, a uh, little bit of type eight will be an exception, but will really can twist themselves into a pretzel and lose parts of themselves in order to stay safe and loved or accepted as much as yeah. possible with a punishment figure. So she's gone. So she's invisible. So she's suppressing everything. She's not speaking up. She's not singing. She's not dancing. She's not showing her art to anybody. She's just like trying to become a gray rock. And she grows up and she meets the Enneagram. She thinks, well, I'm a nine. She's not really a nine. So in interviewing, and we got to actually all of the organizing structure of type four was actually what was really operating. But being type four, being herself caused her so much rejection, so much humiliation, so much shame. She ended up having a, an addiction all of her life. You know, how is she going to medicate the loss of self? So when I go back to saying to, to learn to actually be typed accurately is really a, a, a beautiful part of this journey and, and one that I encourage everybody to pursue um, and pursue diligently. No matter where we enter the Enneagram system, we're going to start learning about defense mechanisms and reactivity and self-awareness. And, and um, we'll learn a lot, even if we're not in our own accurate Enneagram type, but, but the 
the growth will stop at a certain point if we're not actually in our Enneagram type, which is what happened to this gal. Um, so to consult, if you can, and um, you know, certified professionals have a lot of experience in typing to help you do that. The online tests are fun and they're full of great inquiry and it's a great place to just start asking yourself questions, but I don't find them very accurate. And mm. people will get mistyped in an online test and then they think they're that type and then um, yeah. you know, learning has a particular limit to it. The depth of learning about yourself will have a limit as you continue. So, so yeah. how do you, so it's the education that comes with studying the Enneagram of the way personality is organized and formed, what a reaction is, what a defense is. I have to be loved. I have to be this. I can't be that. It's called the trap and the avoidance of type. It's called the split. And um, just, just learning that kind of stuff gives us a chance to know what to look for, right? To, to yeah. I'm going to become self-aware. What am I going to become aware of? You know, it's like, yeah, sure. it, it gives us the clues of like, let to go in. And then, and then you, you, you learn something about Enneagram type one or your one or a seven or, and then you see it on yourself. You're like, Oh my God, that's what that looks like. You know? And so it starts that process really beautiful. Yeah. S sounds, um, sounds, uh, fun. Sounds interesting. <laughs> and yeah, I think we have been going for hour, hour and a half now. But what? from what I understand, yeah, it's crazy. Wow. Right? I, don't, I think it's a little bit, I don't even know. But I think what we understand, at least what I understand, is that Enneagram system, nine types, right? Three in the head, three in the heart, three in the gut. And all the three are similar in the sense that the they share like the same parent, but all how do I say it's almost like the same uh flavoring uh, yeah right it has like a similar touch but it's like uh it's like almost different variations of chocolate is the the image that's coming in my head like dark chocolate milk chocolate you know it's kind of like that yes yeah <laughs> like these are all, these are all chocolate these are all gum pops <laughs> and 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 these are all <laughs> oh there you go <laughs> like that <There> you go. <laughs> <laughs> like it uh so yeah so the next episode so let's i think you said you like to talk from the gut so yeah. we'll start from understanding like the gut type we'll spend like one episode then understanding like the head type or the heart type would be the next episode and let's go like that does that sound good that sounds great. And I'm really yep. glad that we had a chance to do kind of an overview of the Enneagram and mm -hmm. its greater purpose. And I, I really, yeah. I'm grateful to have started with that kind of an intro. Yeah. So set up the foundations and the goal is really clear. Almost, you said almost like unravel who you really are and then having other people work with you. The, 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 the analogy is uh, almost like it feels like we are the conductor in life, you know, and it yeah. feels like we are in an orchestra. The problem is all the musicians, they are like playing very dissonantly. They're not harmonizing together. You know, they're all just playing their own thing and they have like their own reasons to like do so because they think this their, their way is the best way and everyone thinks that way. And as a conductor, you just look and it's just dissonance, cacophony, right? Yes. Uh, yes, so, exactly. So you've got to like and become aware. Three and... centers, right? When our three centers are not aligned, when we're only operating from one, the other two centers are kind of doing their own thing too, you know? So <laughs> yeah, <laughs> getting, getting the three centers online and, and, and integrating them so that they're working together. Now you're really in your sovereign self yeah. and fewer blind spots and you've got mm -hmm. less moments that you're going to go on automatic where you're not aware of what you're doing. That will decrease. Yeah time yeah yeah also i think uh by doing this kind of work it helps you become more of a you're more of like leading the different parts of you rather than trying to like do their work yourself which i think is like super hard you know it's like trying to like defeat a world-class chef and you don't even know how to cook but i feel you can like talk to the world-class chef and say oh, i want this kind of work yeah yeah absolutely right. yeah and I think that's what you're like talking about, right? So almost like use the motherboard rather than change it. 
Oh, and you know, to, to work with the motherboard in a loving and compassionate way, rather than fighting it, hating on it and, and trying to <laughs> take knuckles, yeah. change that is, you know, trying to change who we really are is not possible. Working with and expanding who we really are into higher degrees of presence to self and self-sovereignty. That's what we want to do. Mm. And that's like the, that's like the goal. That's the goal. Yep. And why, why have this goal? Because well, life becomes way more beautiful, fulfilling, far less stressful, far yeah. less acrimonious, far less confusing, far less debilitating, far less self-hating far less disorienting it becomes yeah. livable mm -hmm. and that's the goal so i think i think when you're in that kind of state i, I feel everyone also has like a dream that they want to like actualize i feel when you're in that kind of a uh, uh, place you can much easily actualize a dream and make what you want to come to make like the things you want come true yeah absolutely life becomes easier when you are connected to self and less defended less on automatic less unaware less aware yeah it becomes more fluid more flowing more yeah. passionate more loving more kind more fun yeah it, it almost sounds like a course on practicing love rather than you know because when you love something you have to like take care of it, give it affection, give it time, you know, see beauty in it, respect its sovereignty, like you were talking about. Yeah. They're like all different ways to like practice love, right? Yes. The it does come down to states of love and states mm -hmm. of non-love. Yes, absolutely. Yep. Yeah. And I think that's a beautiful, uh, beautiful way to like end this episode. And the next episode, we'll be talking about the gut type, but let's see how that goes. Thanks for coming on, Susan. Looking forward for the next one. Thank you, Prem, so much.